Uh, I want to take just a few moments this morning to talk to you from the subject, how to control your anger and release your bitterness. How to control your anger and release your bitterness. Now, I just need to let you know up front, I am not afraid of amens. Amen, somebody. So please, uh, y'all, let them flow. And even for those of you who are streaming with us on Facebook, I'm not afraid of amens or the, the little smiley faces or little hearts. Y'all just have y'all way. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so listen, we're going to be unpacking a few verses today and, and dissecting a story about King David. Uh, so you may want to get your notebooks ready to record these verses so you can further study them when you get home, because I'm going to uh, uh, run through some verses, and I'm not going to stop and have you turn to them. I'm just going to read them to you, so just kind of jot them down so you can check it out when you get home. First of all, I need to make a confession to you. God has dealt with me and continues to deal with me with my anger issues. And what I've discovered is that people who are the nicest folk in the world can be the nastiest meanest, angriest people in the world. Uh, I, 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 I've been angry, and a lot of people have issues with anger. And I, I've been angry with, uh, anger with my, uh, uh, angry with my wife and my kids, and I've been angry with my siblings, and I've been angry with my boss, co-workers, and, and God continues to deal with me uh, uh, and challenge me. And so uh, I, I'm just excited about what he's doing with me. And, and, and so I want to share with you what God has shared with me about anger. The Bible has a lot to say about anger. The Bible is, is filled with issues on anger. Now, now, some of you are perpetrating as if you don't have anger issues. I know there's somebody on your row who has an issue with anger. As a matter of fact, just look up and down your row and see if you can figure out who it is. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Do that right now. It's probably the person looking straight ahead at me and not looking either side. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, see... You know, this technology, boy, I tell you. Every day we read and hear of something in the news about somebody doing something that's a reflection of the fact that they don't know how to handle their anger. Uh, there's road rage. Somebody cuts you off. Uh, I just read online just the other day where road rage happened and uh, the offended person followed the woman to her home and shot her because, uh, because folk don't know how to deal with their anger. People don't know how to handle their issues. We all got issues, y'all. Everybody in here and those on the internet streaming got an issue. I got issues, you got issues, we all got issues, but we've got to deal with them. Now, now let me get back to my text in Colossians. Uh, the things that's interesting about Colossians chapter 3, remember, this is Paul's letter to the church. Like Ephesians, the first couple of chapters deal with doctrines, and the last few chapters deal with the practicality of how to live. And so, in Colossians chapter 3, uh, to the end of the book, Paul is telling us how to live our lives. But in chapter 3, verse 8, he tells us that there are some things that we have to put off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy communication out of your mouth. And all of those things, he's talking to me. Uh, see, uh, I'm telling you, uh, all those things he's talking directly to me. So, uh, I, I got to tell you something, y'all. I can cuss. See, y'all were supposed to say, I can too, Pastor. See, y'all missed your, 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 your cue right there. <laughs> don't, don't leave me out there now. <laughs> I, I, I know who I'm talking to, see. <laughs> I grew up in a household, y'all, uh, uh, where, where we were bilingual and cussing was the first language. English was the second. 
But see, I know I don't cuss like y'all cuss, y'all. Uh, see, I have little short cusses. Uh, uh, I may say a word every now and then, uh, but y'all might, yeah, y'all got these, these uh, uh, multiple words. Some of y'all can put a combination together and make cussing sound poetic and comedic. But then I come back and I confess and repent after I do all that. And, and I, 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 look, I'm praising the Lord right this moment because I haven't cussed at anybody all morning. Come on, somebody, uh, you praise God with me. <laughs> so the Bible has a whole lot to say about anger. And I can only scratch the surface about it for what God has to say about anger. Now, now I'm going to just run through some verses today. And my advice to you is to, uh, as I give you these verses, write them down so you can have the opportunity to go review them when you get home. So let's start with James chapter 1, verse 20. I'll be reading this out of the NLT. It says, James chapter 1 tells us a very important thing about anger. Verse 20. Here's what it says. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Now that's a powerful verse right there. Your, your anger, you, you, you're flying off the handle. You cussing people out, uh, you giving people a piece of your mind does not pro produce God's righteousness in that person or in you. Uh, the wrath of man, uh, the, the anger, the, the frustration, the, the disappointment doesn't create righteousness, at least God's righteousness in another person. See, that's an important point because we think if we cuss somebody out, give them a piece of our mind and tell them off, they'll change. Uh, they might change for a minute just to shut you up, but it will not produce lasting change in that person's life. So the scripture tells us that, that there's no need of you flying off the handle on somebody because of what you do in anger is not going to make them change forever. Human anger or the wrath of man does not produce God's righteousness in a person. See, that's James chapter 1, verse 20. Now let's go to Proverbs uh, chapter 29, verse 11. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11. Here's what that verse says. Watch this, y'all. It says, a fool vents all his feelings. Let me pause and say, if you can't say amen, just say ouch. Come on, that's... A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. The Bible says, if you, are, uh, uh, if you start going off, you are a fool. Uh, some people, they just fly off the handle and tell you what they think and how they're feeling with, without someone even asking them. But the scripture says, that's not wise. A wise person learns how to hold back and, 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 uh, and, and, and instead of blurting out everything. Uh, a fool vents whatever he or she is feeling. But a wise person doesn't say everything in the moment. You know, see, watch this. Don't govern your life by how you feel. Let me just say that again. Don't, don't govern your life by how you feel. Your emotions are dangerous. Emotions can be dangerous for you to govern your life off of. As a matter of fact, let's define anger. Anger is an emotion that God gives us that that emotion it really is a signal that there is something in you that's not right. Anger is God's internal warning signal that says, danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger, Will Robinson. See, uh, uh, 35 and over, somebody, some of y'all some didn't catch that, okay. See, that's a line from the robot character on the show Lost in Space. Uh, you, 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 you know, uh, 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 the, the robot, and, 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 and then, then on that show, um, there was a robot, and any time the little boy, Will Robinson, was about to get in trouble, the robot would say, danger, danger, Will Robinson. If you ever get a chance to uh, go to TV Land channel and watch Lost in Space, that was some good, wholesome family TV. Uh, uh, so watch that when you get a chance. See, that, 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 that's anger, is that danger, is an alarm, uh, that, that when you feel anger, that's God's way of saying that there's something in you that's not proper. 
Anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Anger is also a feeling that makes someone want to hurt other people. There's another type of anger called God's anger. Yes, God does get angry, uh, but his anger is always under control and is always righteous. We call it righteous indignation. What is righteous indignation? Righteous indignation is an anger you get when seeing people get mistreated or insulted or, or committing social injustice while watching a police officer's murder, George Floyd. Uh, God gets angry at sin. Sometimes God gets angry at individuals. Sometimes God gets angry at nations. We need to get angry with what God is angry about. Amen? Now, now, now let's go to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. And it says, watch this, make no friendship with an angry man with a furious man, do not go. Verse 25 says, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. <laughs> he says, look, be very, be very careful. If you see a person with a problem with anger, don't go around them. Let, let me speak to my single ladies up in here this morning. Uh, where are my single ladies at? All my single ladies. All my single ladies. If you liked it, you should have put a ring on it. Don't get mad once you see that he wanted. it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's that Beyonce spirit just <laughs> dropped on me for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> single ladies, if you're hanging out with a brother and he has an anger issue, you need to cut that thing off right now. That's a sign. That's a signal. Now, now, if he's flying off the handle, that's a sign and that's a signal for you because I know you think, watch this, I know you think that you can change him. I know you think you can make him better, but you can't change him. The Bible says the wrath of man cannot produce the righteousness of God. You cannot change him. Uh, you can't make him better. That's not your job to do that anyway. If he has an anger issue, if he puts his hands on you, you, uh, you got some major decisions to make right at that point. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I didn't make this up. It says make no friendships, good God Almighty, with an angry man. That goes for anybody right there. If a brother got an anger issue, don't be his friend. And don't go where he's going because you might become just like him. Can I get an amen right there? It got a little silent. Okay. Y'all may not like this type of preaching right here, but, but, but uh, I want you to go back with me one more verse to uh, go back to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Let's take a look at that. Proverbs verse 19. Uh, now, now, brothers, this is for you. Where are my brothers at? Oh. Uh, <laughs> what happened? Y'all scared? Where are my brothers at? There they go. There they go. <laughs> Let me read this to you, brothers. It says, better to dwell in the wilderness than when a contentious and angry woman. Mm. See, I... I see my, 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 I see the men, I'm looking out, I see the brothers in here, uh, they, 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 they get a little scared right now, because watch this, get the picture. The Bible says, it's better for you to get a tent and a sleeping bag and go live in the woods. Uh, see, it's better to, to, to go live in the woods by yourself than to live in a house with a, a woman who has an anger issue. Mm. Uh, a woman who likes to start arguments, they call her contentious. Uh, th that's serious right there, y'all. See, I, I, I know the brothers can't say amen, uh, but that's all right. J just, just wink at your boy real quick. Just wink at me. And, and I want you to wink with the eye that's on the opposite side uh, of where she is so you don't get in trouble. Just, okay. If y'all can see the winks coming at me right now. <laughs> see, anger is not a... A positive attribute. People don't want to be around folk with anger issues. 
See, I've seen pretty women who become ugly because they have an anger issue. The Bible says it's better to live by yourself in the woods. Isn't that a powerful scripture right there, y'all? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Here's what it says. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, now, let me be clear, y'all, because some people think that this is a directive to be angry. Uh, let me give you the proper interpretation of the passage, y'all. It's not telling you to be angry. In essence, it's saying when you become angry, uh, when you have anger come upon you, don't sin by letting the sun go down on your unresolved anger. It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Or don't let the day in and you still got this anger floating around in your heart. Why? Because it only grows. If you don't deal with it, it grows. If you don't handle it, it gets stronger. The Bible says fix it before the day is over. Now, now, can I tell you a story? Uh, I got a little story to tell you. You, you probably heard this story before, but this story is about uh, it's a story about a king by the name of David. Uh, I, I know Pastor Ken well, and I know uh, he likes to preach about King David. And, and King David is a man that had a lot of drama in his life, just like some of you have a lot of drama in your life. King David had a lot of problems and issues in his life. Uh, he did some good, but he also did a lot of bad. What amazes me about King David, in spite of all the wrong in his life, in spite of all the bad that he did, the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. But something happened in uh, David's life that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, he has come up, King David has come up through the ranks he was a shepherd boy taking care of his daddy's sheep. From there, uh, he ends up having, uh, uh, having a prophet prophesy over him that he would be the king of Israel. Uh, from there, he finds himself going out to the battlefield, killing Goliath. And y'all know that story. And from there, and through a series of, of events, David becomes a king. He becomes the king of Israel. David surrounds himself with people who are wise and influential. Now, I, I've learned that that is not the president of the United States job that, that, that he always calls the, shop, the shots, y'all, but it's the people around him uh, he, uh, that's able to influence him on what calls to make. David is surrounded by people who are influencers to him. He's unlike any other leader, y'all. He, he's the leader that takes counsel from wise people that influences him. David had a, a person in particular who influenced him and a person who the Bible tells us a little bit about, just a little bit. And, and we can derive a lot of insight about him by the few things that the Bible tells us about him. Now, now, now it's time to go uh, for us. Why don't you, why don't you run to uh, 2 Samuel again. Chapter 16, that's our text, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16. And, and just walk with me. I promise I'll be finished uh, when I'm done. Okay, uh, 2 Samuel uh, 16, 23. Uh, it says, Absalom followed Ahithophel's advice, just, at, just as David had done. For, for every word Ahithophel spoke seemed as wise, watch this, as though it had come directly from the mouth of God. Uh, there, there are just a couple of verses that talk about Ahithophel, but here's one that is powerful. It says, when you talk to Ahithophel, it's just like you're talking to God. Mm. Uh, I don't know about you, but I want to be in that situation when, where that when people talk to you, they feel like they are talking to God. Uh, now, now, now you, you just ought to be honest. What has gotten a lot of us in the mess we are in is that you listen to some folk who didn't give you godly advice. Well, Ahithophel was an advisor and a counselor to King David. When Ahithophel spoke to, to both David and his son Absalom, uh, the Bible said it was just as if he was an oracle of God. That, that's chapter 16, verse 23. 
That's what it says. He was the voice of God. But when you go to the next chapter, chapter 17, 23, one chapter over, uh, verse 23, 23 says, when Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey, went to his hometown, set his affairs in order, and hanged himself. He died there and was buried in the family tomb. Good God Almighty. That man went from being a spokesman of God, and when, when, you, when you talk to him, it is as if he, he, he's talking uh, like you're talking to God. One chapter later, he commits suicide. One chapter later. Something, y'all, has happened to Ahithophel that caused him to make a horrifying choice. I just need y'all to hang with me for a few more moments. I wanted to explain to you what happened to Ahithophel that brought him to a place where he felt he needed to end his life. Something happened to him. Something caused him to be angry and bitter. What caused Ahithophel to not want to live any longer? What caused him to end his life? And here it is. It's called anger and bitterness. That, 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 that's what I want to talk to you for the last few moments that I have today. I want to talk to you about the keys to control your anger and release your bitterness. Would you just look at your neighbor and, 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 and say, you, you need these keys. Go ahead, just tell them. You, you, you need these keys. Because, my brothers and sisters, if you don't overcome your bitterness... If you don't uh, get control of your anger and being mad and not forgiving the folk, let me say that again. Uh, if you don't control your anger, being mad, and not forgiving people, I'm telling you, it will take you out. It will destroy you. It will make you sick. As a matter of fact, you can't even have a meaningful relationship with God while you're walking around harboring bitterness in your heart against somebody else. What caused him to get so angry and bitter that it ended his life? Let me tell you what happened. And, 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 and while we talk about this, you, you, I hope to, you to gain some of these truths and principles uh, while we go on. Well, here's the story. David has risen up to become king. He's the head honcho. He's the H-N-I-C. He's the chief man in charge, or in this case, he's the H-J-I-C, uh, the head Jew in charge. Come on. Uh, uh, he, he, he's large and in charge of everything. But one day, David is strolling on the roof of his palace. And while he's strolling on the roof of his palace, he looks across the street at the townhouse complexes. Uh, and on the roof of the townhouse is this young, beautiful woman named Bathsheba, and she was taking a bath. Something arose up in David, and as he, <laughs> somebody caught that, but that's all right. Y'all you know, get it next week. Uh, uh, and, so, and he beckons to, for Bathsheba to come to his chambers. And Bath, Bathsheba comes to the chambers. David sleeps with her and sends her back to his house. Now, David has a big problem. Bathsheba sends word back. One verse says, he, uh, David calls her over. He sleeps with her. The next verse says, she sends him a word that she is pregnant. The problem is, is Bathsheba is married. She's married to a soldier who's off to war. Uh, his name is Uriah. David gets the word that she's pregnant, and he doesn't know what to do, so he comes up with a, a plot and a scheme. Uh, and his plot and scheme is this. He's going to go over his tracks by uh, beckoning Uriah to come from battle, come from war, and come home. And he's thinking that if Uriah would just come home from war and go to his house, sleep with his wife, and then go back to war, then when he, she says she's pregnant, he would think that the child is his. Somebody, somebody turn to your neighbor and say, people can be slick. Go ahead. Just uh, see, y'all, y'all, y'all don't need to need, y'all don't need to watch these reality shows on TV. Just read the Bible. Leave the Real Housewives of Atlanta alone. It's right here in the Bible. 
Amen. So, so, so Uriah comes from the battle, and he's back in town. And when he gets home, instead of going to his house, he says to himself, how can I go into my home, enjoy the pleasures of my wife, while my brothers are out there in the field putting their lives on the line at war? Uh, would you just look at your name one more time for me and say, Uriah must not be a black man. Go ahead, just. <laughs> Can I get an amen from somebody right there? As a matter of fact, when Uriah doesn't go into the house and sleep with his wife, when the king hears about that he didn't do that, uh, the king comes up with an additional scheme. He, he invites Uriah to a party and gets him drunk and thinking that, uh, that when Uriah gets in his drunken stupor, he will somehow uh, make it back to his house and think that he has slept with his wife. Well, no matter what happens, no matter how drunk he gets, he never goes back to the house to sleep with his wife. David, y'all, has a problem now. Now. He has done wrong. He has slept with this man's wife. And the problem with what David has done, he has already had a, well, he already has a multiplicity of wives. And, and it's not like he needed another one. The problem with sin is that sin is never satisfied. Why don't you repeat that? Say sin is never satisfied. So she, he is not satisfied, and he has to have Bathsheba. Now that Uriah has refused to go to sleep with his wife, finally the king writes out a decree, a letter. He seals it up and gives it to Uriah and sends him back to the battlefield. Uriah has to deliver the sealed letter to General Joab. And here's what David wrote on it with his own hand. The note said, put Uriah in the heat of the hottest battle on the front line and pull back the troops so he will be killed. And when he is dead, let me know. See, that amazes me. For a man that the scripture says is after God's own heart, he has some nasty stuff on the inside of him. Y'all might as well say amen because as much as you want God and much as you love God, you got some nasty stuff on the inside of you too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, so Uriah is carrying out his own death warrant. He gives it to the general. The general follows his orders and puts Uriah in the heat of the battle. He withdraws the, the support troops. Uriah is killed and word gets back to David that Uriah is dead. He then takes Bathsheba as his wife. The problem is that a lot of us don't realize, watch this, that David, uh, and David didn't realize this, that when you do stuff, there's always somebody watching you. Mm. And, 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 and I, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about God watching you. Uh, we all need to understand that when you sneak in, in, in through the back door and run to do your deal, and then creep over here and creep over there, doing what you're trying to do to be slick about it, somebody sees you that you don't see. And such is the case with David. David thought he can get away with it. How could the king think he could be so slick with it? He's surrounded by soldiers. He's surrounded by protection. He's surrounded by counselors. Why did he think he could get away with sleeping with Bathsheba and getting her husband killed? Why did he think he can get away with it? Well, uh, and the word about what happened, watch this, the word about what happened got back to and had been observed by his counselor, Ahithophel. Now I get back to Ahithophel. Ahithophel sees and knows and learns about what David has done and becomes angry. Not only does he become angry, but he becomes bitter. Ahithophel is so angry and bitter that he stopped being David's counselor. Here's what the scripture says, that Ahithophel left King David and joined up with his son, David's son, Absalom, who was in the process of trying to overthrow David's kingdom. And, and, and Ahithophel began to counsel Absalom. I'm almost finished here. Now, now, now I was hoping 
when I just said I'm almost finished, that somebody would take you, uh, somebody would say, take your time, doctor. Take your time. Y'all missing y'all cues here. Uh, Ahithophel gets angry and bitter, and, and he's mad at David. And this is what caused this man uh, uh, to lose his walk with God, y'all. This is what brought him to the place of committing suicide, because bitterness took over his heart. Why was Ahithophel so bitter? He was bitter because Bathsheba, the woman to whom David married after he slept with her, uh, the woman to whom David committed adultery with, that Bathsheba was Ahithophel's granddaughter. Ahithophel could not get it through his head that the man that he was serving, the king of the land, had not only committed adultery with his granddaughter and she was married to another man, but he also had the man killed. And he no longer could serve him. He could no, no longer be joined to him. He became bitter. Some of you have had some people do some horrific things to you. And, and what you failed to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of times what you failed to understand and what you need to understand is I don't care how nasty, how mean, if somebody does something to you, it's not worth you losing your life over. Uh, because based on what they, they have done. Uh, some of you have gotten bitter because somebody said something about you and got you fired off your job. Somebody abused you or done something to you that, that, that you've harbored it and you've carried it around in your heart and you haven't forgiven them. A matter of fact, when you, uh, when you hear their name... <clears throat> you start feeling a little mad. If they enter the room, you leave the room. If you hear them coming to the party, you ain't going. You don't answer their phone calls. You don't return their emails. You're just bitter. You're angry. You're mad. And you can't get over it. The, see, uh, that, that movie is playing in your mind over and over again what they've done to you. It's just playing over and over. You keep seeing the movie. You're seeing all this stuff. And now, because that movie's been playing over and over and over again, as a matter of fact, the movie has played so many times in your mind, it now has credits directed by by, exec executive produced by, soundtrack by. Preach on, Pastor Mike. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. I'm going to just motivate myself. <laughs> My assignment is to challenge you and tell you what, what and how you can, uh, how to overcome bitterness. Uh, so let me give you the four keys uh, about uh, this real quick. I'm going to hit you real fast with these four keys and take my seat. Here's number one. I want you to realize that what they did is not worth you damaging your relationship with God. Realize what they did is not worth you damaging your relationship with God. Because here's the bottom line. When you allow somebody to embitter you, it impacts your relationship with God. You cannot fail to forgive somebody for what they've done and harbor it in your mind and it not have consequences on your own per personal relationship with God. Now, here's the thing. I know I'm saved, not because I've spoken in tongues, and not because I've danced the holy dance, and not because I pay my tithes. I, I know I'm saved, and the reason I know I'm saved is because the God in me, the Christ in me, has given me the capacity to forgive others who I, don't, who I know don't like me. Because in my flesh, in my natural abilities, in my own strength and abilities, I can't forgive them for what they've done. Uh, I, I, I try, uh, I, if, I, if I left to myself, I might try to hurt them as much as they try to hurt me. But, but, but I know I'm saved, and I know I've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of me, uh, because even though they try to hurt me, kill me, damage my reputation, I still love them. I still pray for them. I still do whatever I can to help them. Greater is he that is in me that is he that is in the world. I know he lives in me. Because if it was up to me, it'd be tight on them. If it was up to me, I would do like my old uncle did. Where my knife at? Back then, they didn't carry a gun. He just always had him a knife. But I know God's in me. 
Uh, so, so, so my assignment is to tell you, watch this, that whatever they've done to you is not you worth losing your job over. Ooh, 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 ooh. I got that Miss Seely spirit just came over. Whatever you did to me comes back to you. Ahithophel couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure out how to forgive David for what he did. He couldn't figure it out how to get past it. He couldn't figure out how to let it go. David repented to God. David apologized to God. David wrote a whole psalm about it. Ahithophel couldn't let it go. And he kept harboring it in his heart. Just like some of you are harboring in your heart the stuff that people have done to you. And it's impacting your ability to move forward in your life with God. Just let it go. Just let it go. We just got to let it go. See, that's number one. Here's number two. The second point that you need to overcome the bitterness to realize that, uh, that you yourself is not to judge. You got to realize that God is the ultimate judge. Let me explain a very important principle. When somebody hurts you and then you got so mad and so angry and you act as if you're God and you want vengeance, here's what Romans 12, 19 says. It says this, and I need you to write this down. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. He says, I will repay, says the Lord. God says, I'll do it. They wronged you. I saw it. I'm going to get them back. Now, this is an important point. Here's what I feel God does, y'all. Some of y'all are trying to pay people back from what they've done to you, and you're trying to hurt them back. You won't talk to them. You won't write them back. You won't communicate. You say wicked things about them. And here's what God says. God says, watch this. He says, okay, I see, I see you're going to give them vengeance. Uh, okay, you, you go ahead and do that, and I'll just take my hands off. You want vengeance, you want to repay, you go ahead. I'll take my hands off. And I'm here to tell you that, that, that it's best for you to let God do it, uh, let God do the vengeance, rather than you try to do vengeance. Because when God fixes it, when God pays them back, they will be paid back right Somewhere down the line, you've got to get to a place where you take your hands off and say, God, I'm not going to talk, ba- talk bad about them. I'm not going to try to hurt them. I'm not going to ruin their reputation. I'm not going to try to uh, uh, get them fired. Uh, they did all that to me, but I'm going to treat them, treat them the way that I want to be treated. I- I'm going to love on them. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to speak well of them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm not going to do them like they did me. Good God Almighty. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. He's the ultimate judge here. here here's number three. Uh, not only is God the ultimate judge, but here's point three. That we need to realize that you are not sinless. Why, why are you so quick to find out the wrong that everybody else has done? Let me remind you that there are some people that you have wronged. There are some people that you have hurt. There are some things that you have done that damaged other people. And just like you want somebody to forgive you, you've got to learn how to forgive somebody else. Is there anybody in here that can say amen? Nobody in here is perfect. Nobody in here has dotted every I. Nobody in here has crossed every T. Nobody in here has done everything that they're supposed to do. We all, uh, we, we have not always been where we are. We have not always done the things that we're supposed to do. And just like you need God to forgive you and you need other people to forgive you, you need to forgive somebody for what they have done to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if you don't forgive others, what they've done to you, God cannot forgive you for what you've done to somebody else. You need forgiveness, so you need to be forgiven. So you need to forgive. Here's my last point. Here's my last point. Uh, did you get the first three points, y'all? 
What was the first one? It's not worth damaging your relationship. What was number two? God said, I'm a... And number three, amen. You're walking around harboring these feelings like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Uh, See, I feel a cussing spirit coming on me right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I I, I won't cuss, I won't. But, 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 But people get on my nerves acting like they have never done nothing wrong. I get, I get angry. I get mad when you walk around with your nose up in the air like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Like, like, even you, like you've been saved all your life. Like you, you are Miss Perfect or Mr. Perfect. God, 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 God. Push that down. Let me calm down. Uh, here's number four. Realize, instead of being bitter, realize somebody uh, going... I'm I realizing somebody probably going to shout on this, but okay. Realize that the pain that someone caused you actually helped to promote you. The pain that somebody has caused you actually really helped to promote you. Anybody, uh, anybody in here ready to say to somebody, if you had not done to me what you did to me, I will not be where I am today. <laughs> what you did pushed me forward. What you did helped me to get where God wanted me to be. Uh, if you had not done it, some of you need to go back to some people and say, remember when you hurt me? Remember when you lied on me? Remember when you got me fired? Thank you. Remember when you played me? Remember when you quit me? Remember when you want me, when you didn't want me no more? Thank you. Now I got the wife of my dreams. Now I got the husband of my dreams. Come on now. You remember that? Now I got the job of my dreams. Now I'm at the church that I'm supposed to be now based on how you treated me at the last church. Thank you. Thank you. I almost lost my mind from the way you treated me. I decided to let it go, and when I let it go, God swept me into my destiny. God ushered me to where I'm supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you for releasing me. Thank you. Thank you. Watch this. Thank you for not choosing me. Just imagine if you had a married that joker that... I heard somebody said I did. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Thank you. Somebody, they say divorce is crazy, but, but sometimes thank you, God, for the release. Ha. Hey, y'all, I, I love Joseph because Joseph was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery. Lied on by Potiphar's wife, forgotten about by his jailmates, but but all of that helped get him to where God wanted him to be. And that's what I'm trying to help you see. All the pain, all the agony, and the stuff that went wrong, God used them to be agents to get you to where you are today. Somebody help me give God some praise for that right now. I'm done. I'm done. I'm finished. But, but who was I preaching to today? Huh. See, some of you have been angry and bitter. And now, and now you're ready to let it go. If that's you, why don't you just stand to your feet right now? Stand to your feet if you're ready to let that go. If you've been holding a grudge... Stand right there where you are. If you get bad feelings every time you think about them, that hurts you. Come on, stand to your feet. When when the name pops up, you can't stand it. You can stand to your feet. Good God Almighty. Come on, y'all. Look around the room. Look at the folks that's standing. Uh, Wow. They've been holding 
Those folks have been who you've been mad at back. The folks you've been mad at, that's been holding you back. Your bitterness has been holding you back from getting you to the place where God wants you to be. There hasn't been no blessing in your life because you keep harboring bitterness. Let it go. Let the anger go. Huh. Let it go. When you let it go, the blessings will start falling on you. This is the thing that has kept God from having the capacity to, to rain blessings on you because you've been carrying anger and bitterness. They are not worth it. Hallelujah. It's over now. It's over, y'all. It's going to be released off you. It's over now. You're not held bondage to it any longer. The devil can't hold you captive any longer. He can't contain you no more. It's coming off of you today. This is the day that God is letting it be loose. It's over today. You are letting it go today. It's not going to be uh, get between you and God uh, no more. All over the room, if, would you just pray with me? Those of you are standing, if you can, lift your hands. Those of you who are still with us on the internet, some of you are probably standing on your feet. Lift your hands where you are. Say this prayer with me. Say, Father, in, the, in Jesus' name, uh, this church is filled with people who acknowledge their bitterness and their ability to forgive. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, they're acknowledging that they have harbored something in their heart. And they don't want to, to be like Ahithophel. They, 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 they want to move on in life. And, and they want to be your instrument. They want to be forgiven. And they want to be your mouthpiece. And Father, I thank you that they've heard and they've listened and they've yielded. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you release them right now from carrying bitterness. Right now, God, right now, bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. Uh, right now, God, uh, bind unforgiveness uh, right now. Rebuke it, Lord. Loose them from it right now, God. I pray you would allow forgiveness to be smeared all over them. Smeared all over their mind. Smeared forgiveness all over their heart right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, all over the room, I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I confess my sin to you. I am guilty. I have it forgiven. I've been bitter. But today, I release it. I forgive the person. Say it one more time. I forgive the person. Say it for a third time. I, I forgive the person. I hold them harmless. I believe now that all things work together for my good. And I thank you that I am better because of what has happened to me. That, you, that you've had my back. And Father, I realize no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And right now, I release that person in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Come on, say thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now go ahead and give God some praise in this place. All over the room, give God some praise in this place. It's over now. It's over now. It's over now. Uh, God said, lifted this thing off you. It's over now. Come on, one more time. Give God some praise. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Pastor Marlon.